Hello, I'm Katie Whitcrem Singh, and I'm super excited today to be joining you from Sotheby's in London, where we're about to get a sneak peek preview of some of the best contemporary and modern artworks that are about to go into one of their biggest auction moments to date. The contemporary evening sale and now evening sale taking place on the 12th of October, and also the contemporary day auction taking place on the 13th. Coinciding with Freeze, October is a time which sees the global art world descend onto London. And today we're going to be diving in some of the stories and artists behind these paintings in auction as I catch up with Sotheby's art historians and specialists on some of the highlights. We're now joined by specialist Antonia to talk about an Elizabeth Payton work, David, Victoria and Brooklyn. Thank you so much for joining us, Antonia. So why is this work so important as part of Payton's practice? Well, Payton always takes these subjects, you know, that are, she has this big obsession with idolatry and um, people's obsession with fame. And she's painted a whole host of, of different famous people, you know, Prince Harry, Prince William, all the way to David Bowie. And in this painting, we have uh, David and Victoria Beckham. And this was painted right at the peak of their fame in the late 1990s. And you see this extraordinary movement of them. It's caught by the paparazzi. You've got Brooklyn being held by Victoria. And what's also so special about this work is that Peyton usually works on this very jewel-like small scale. She mm -hmm. painted really beautiful, tiny little paintings. But what we have here is a ginormous scale. It's 150 by about 100 centimeters wide. And you really become involved in the scene. You know, with her smaller paintings, you stand as an outsider. Whereas here, we're kind of very much enveloped into the drama. It's amazing work in terms, obviously, the familiarity of the faces, but they're almost drawn in an art historical context. It could be almost a Madonna and child. And with Peyton, obviously, in her practice, she talks about faces containing their reality. And there's a real specificity in the way that she paints and capturing eras. Can you talk to us about this particular work, how she's done that through her technique? Yeah, so I think what works so, so well with this painting is, is her capture of time. And it's not only using the faces, it's using the hands as well. When you look at the painting, you see Victoria kind of turns away. Neither of the main protagonists are looking at us. And Victoria looks away, she's got this wild look in her eyes and she seems very scared. David, he's got this protective arm around her and she's seeing, if you look at her hands, she's really grasping the baby. And I think what makes her so specific is at this exact moment, in the 1990s, Brooklyn was subject to lots of kidnap uh, threats. So on the, on the one hand, you see this very glitzy paparazzi image, this great celebration of fame. But what's so strong about Peyton is that she really dives to the core of celebrity and she really kind of exposes often that dark side. And here it's that, that fear of the kidnap and it's that kind of duality that I think makes her such a successful work. Definitely, and it feels like she's constantly having a dynamic conversation with the viewer, even though the subjects are often looking away. And obviously this year is such a big one with portraiture mm -hmm. in London with the National Portrait Gallery and its transformation project. So why is this work so important to take note of as part of a wider collection? On one hand, it's very classical, the way that she builds with the paint, and it's this gorgeous, kind of almost looks like tempera in the way that she uses the actual paint and builds up these gorgeous surfaces in it. But at the same time, it's so contemporary. You know, she paints these very contemporary subjects, and they're always just utterly kind of snapshots of a moment in time, which I think just makes her so special to, to And her, her process is quick, isn't it? She, yes. she creates work very quickly. Yes, and there's very lucid, very, very thin layers that she's building up and it creates this extraordinary transparency and color. You, there's a real vividness, especially to these early 1990s works. There's a, such a strong color. And as you can see that, you know, in David's shirt, in the glorious tan of Simon Fuller that you don't see so much in her later works. So we now come to Six Birds in the Bush, one of Lynette Yadambrachi's incredible works, which was seen in her Tate retrospective. So Antonio, I'm really excited to talk to you about this work. It's one of my favorites. And why is it so characteristic of Lynette's work? The subjects that she paints aren't actually of anyone in particular. She creates these scrapbooks of different images that she uh, collects from newspapers, photographs, she does some sketches builds them all up together, and then she creates these figures herself in her memory, and they're all done within one day. So she does these extraordinary expressive flurries of brushstrokes to create a final painting, but it's of no one in particular. And that's, I think, what makes them so special. 
And although it's a very contemporary work, she's obviously using this play on art historical references that we can mm. see in some of the details of the works. Can you talk us through some of those details? Yeah, so I think this one is a particularly art historical work and it really kind of has that extraordinary regal almost resonance to it. You've got the figure, he's kind of turned half to his side and it kind of really feels like one of those Dutch old masters, you know, people like Rembrandt, and it's got a great weight and this kind of great sense of power. And you've got this gorgeous big uh, purple plume that comes out of his hat uh, that really it's you know, regal, feels, isn't yeah, it? exactly. And again, with the purple, that kind of royal connotation. And likewise, Lynette's kind of posited herself almost at, a, at an angle to that art history that we're just talking about by, you know, only painting black subjects. And she's a black artist herself. And so it's, it's kind of taking that history and reinterpreting it for the modern day. And she's not just a painter. She talks about this idea of, I paint what I cannot write and I write what I cannot paint. Yeah. So why is the title so significant? What a lot of people don't realise is that she's also a writer and she writes poetry and things like that. And it kind of really adds a sense to her painting. So what she, you know, it could almost be seen as an additional brushstroke, you know, on top of the work where you've got the ambiguity of the subject and we don't know, you know who they are because they're entirely imaginary and every viewer who comes to see the painting adds their own conclusions, their own opinions to the painting. The painting is so commanding. Mm. It really forces us, like a Manet or a Degas, to really be looking and seeing continually. So understandably, Lynette's uh, Yadam Bwachi's work has had universal recognition. It's been shown all over the world. She had her retrospective that was famously paused and then restarted because of COVID. But why do you feel she's such a significant artist? For me, she's just completely reinterpreted um, the portraiture canon to be able to speak to both of these times. You know, it's so contemporary, yet so rooted in art history. I think what's so special about this work is the extraordinary gaze of the central figure. He's got this bright whites in his eyes and I think that's where she really, really comes into her own and really vivifying something that was never even really alive to begin with. And I think that's really what makes it so special. Yeah, it's an incredible work, truly capturing the essence of humanity. Yeah. We now come to the work of one of the most prolific painters of our time, Cecily Brown, also known as the alchemist of paint. We're going to be discussing her work that's coming up in auction, Tricky, with Tom. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Pleasure. So talk to us about this work. It's energetic, it's explosive. How is it characteristic of Brown? I think what you see in Cecily's work and what's really emblematic of what we're selling, Tricky from 2001, is decades worth of the investigation of painting, I think. Cecily's work is really rooted in the grand tradition of Western art and mm -hmm. painting, and she really sits at the vanguard of contemporary painting today. I think she's been well known for talking about the relevance and the inspiration behind many of her paintings that are indeed rooted in painter's past, you know, going all the way back from the Baroque period, old masters, through to modern day greats. Um, one can only think of, you know, Rubens, de Kooning. You have this horizon line, but you almost see the figures emerging up. One thinks of past paintings like Jericho's Raft mm -hmm. of the Medusa, or even Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People. Um, and that's really of no coincidence because she's so rooted in the tradition of painting in, in Western art. And we see that in Tricky, don't we? These elements of Krasner mixed with Cezanne and this kind of explosive movement, which is only characteristic of Brown's work. What would you say in terms of her style? She's often been known to be kind of hard to categorise. Why is that? You have this explosion and arresting nature in her paintings. You have this rich tapestry of paint and painting. You know, it's often referred her works blur the lines between figuration and abstraction. And I think that's what you see here. Mm -hmm. Her works stop you in your tracks and ensure that you are pulled into the painting, investigating. I think we as a viewer are caught in that liminal space between figuration and abstraction. Nothing is obvious, yeah. but it makes you investigate. You see little glimpses here between figuration, landscape. It makes you work and makes you investigate. And I think that's what, what is so captivating about her work. And institutionally, she's mm -hmm. obviously been well regarded. She's had an incredible number of shows, uh, but she's got quite a significant one in New York and she obviously yep. moved there a long time ago. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? 
Well, exactly. Um, she's currently on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a huge accolade um, for any painter. It's afforded an opportunity that you know not many living artists get. I think Lucian Freud was the last British painter mm. um, to have that. And I think what's so fantastic and resolute about Cecily's work is when you think about when she started painting, she came out of the Slade School in London in the early 1990s um, and really was a painter at a time where painting and paintbrushes weren't really in vogue. If you think yeah. about the YBAs, Damien Hirst, Sarah Lucas, much more conceptual, but she was very resolute in being a painter. And I think for her work, the medium of paint and painting is really the only method in which can really imbue the subject matter with such relevance and arresting nature. And this work really is arresting in its nature. Yeah. So we now come to one of the greatest painters of the 20th century, someone who was able to capture the very essence of what it is to be human, Francis Bacon. So Tom, talk to us about the work that you have coming up in auction. We have this incredible painting, Study for a Portrait from 1979, in this iconic 14 by 12 inch single canvas, which really stood as the sort of central tenant for much of his work um, from the 1960s onwards. And it was really the canvas, the the platform in which he forged his most significant investigations into the human condition. So this was painted in 1979, which was quite a significant period for the artist in his life. What was happening at that period in time? It's rather late in his career, but I think if, if, we, if we go back to where it began and where these investigations of these single panels started in the early 1960s, we really get to where um, he was. So in the early 1960s, he was forging these very intense small scale canvases of people around him, the people he knew, um, you know, the great coterie of sitters that were part of his sort of Soho set. One thinks of Lucian Freud, Muriel Belcher, Isabel Rawlsthorne, and of course his lover, George Dyer. And one thinks of these paintings in that period as very emotional, very intense, mm -hmm. um, often violent, not least the sort of ones of George Dyer. And then a really significant event happened in 1971. He was on the eve of his great retrospective at the Grand Palais in Paris, and George Dyer, his lover, tragically uh, committed suicide. This hugely tumultuous event at his greatest critical moment. Mm -hmm. um, that forged a new new turn in his career in the 1970s and what he was painting. You know, he famously said, I'm just p painting myself, everyone I know is dying around me. Mm -hmm. And what you see is this period of 20 odd self-portraits from, from the 1970s onwards, this period of self-reflection. It was, it was him looking at himself as he was aging, so to speak. And we know, don't we, that another figure of significance came into his life around that time, who possibly is the subject of this portrait. Yeah, so you have that turning point. And part of that, you know, he moved to Paris. Um, he, he was a great Francophile. And he met John Edwards, um, another um, character from the East End of London, much younger than him, and formed this great friendship. And I think that coupled with his move to France, you see a new direction, a shift mm -hmm. in his work, um, certainly in terms of the palette, which we see here, it's much softer. These pale blues, cadmium reds, pinks, oranges. Um, mm -hmm. It's much more indicative of, one thinks of Edgar Degas' pastels. It's softer yeah. um, in, the, in the, this French style. Coupled with you know, this new meeting of John Edwards, this youthful character in his life, he's probably you know, sick of painting himself um, as he aged. That Jean Coteau quote of every day I watch death at work in the mirror yeah. um, was, was no truer than, than Bacon in his own sort of sardonic way. But this relationship of youth, you see it here, you see a much more youthful character on the canvas. Um, whilst it's not overtly named as John Edwards, mm -hmm. um, the iterations are almost definitely of him, the white crisp shirt collar, the youthful face, the dark hair, and it, and it forged a new period of work from there on out. Yeah, it's a work that really draws you in and definitely an artist that's one of my favorite <laughs> in the cells. So thank you for talking us through. Pleasure. So I'm here with specialist Lisa, who's going to talk us through some of the highlights from the contemporary day sale. And we're going to kick off with Nicole Eisenman. So Lisa, talk to us a little bit about this work. This is a fantastic painting by Nicole Eisenman um, called Support Systems for Women. It's painted in 1998 and really showcases so much of what Nicole Eisenman is doing in her oeuvre. 
She's someone who has an absolute commitment to interrogating contemporary issues and critiquing uh, current affairs and political questions in a really kind of characteristically witty manner. Mm -hmm. And this specific painting is a little bit of a pastiche on many different things. So we see this fantastic kind of odalisque figure, this large nude, which is very reminiscent of art historically, very, very well-known painting by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, his grand odalisque, which has the same figure, the same format. And um, what Nicole Eisenman has done is, is taken this subject matter, the trope of the female nude, and brought it into a contemporary discourse by kind of jokingly putting this quite haphazard, if you look at it, wooden structure, which doesn't really look like it could support anything, mm -hmm. let alone this really quite grand figure. A lot of her work seems to comment on political structures, on structures around female discourse, and that seems to obviously touch on some of her personal experiences that influence this work as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So her personal experience, you know, starting off as a painter in the 1990s, as a lesbian painter um, in, a sort of in New York, and um, really actually kind of started to become quite successful quite quickly. Um, in 1995, her work was featured in the Whitney Biennial. And then this painting comes in 1998, you know, looking at the, the structure, the support, the institutional support that a woman might need or might sort of have imposed upon her. Actually, if you look at this painting, she's standing on her own two feet and this structure is maybe not supporting her as much as you might think. She then actually, early in the 2000s, starts to do a body of work which um, looks at the idea of success and what would mean if you sort of your success starts to decline. So she's obviously very engaged with her own identity as an artist as well. And she's also an artist that not only paints but makes incredible sculpture. And this work preceded the start of some of those sculptures which were informed by some of these so-called structures. Yeah, and actually as a painter, she has spoken a lot about how important she feels sculpture is to painting. So she says actually, you know, in order to be a good painter, you need to be able to sculpt to understand sculpture. And here we actually have a painting that's kind of doing both. So Lisa, we're now going to be talking about another work that was made just one year later in 1999 from Marlene Dumas. So this is a fantastic painting called Sea Love, uh, where she presents us with this very striking figure of the female nude. Duma obviously has a South African background and continually plays on these images around identity. And here she's actually reclaiming the female nude. Why is that so relevant and important in this work? So actually, Marlene Dumas speaks about how she paints images and not people. And that's very important when you look at her practice and what she's doing in the source material that she's using. So she takes so many different sources from magazines, newspapers, photographs, and actually even takes her own Polaroids from which she works. And then uses her incredible ability as a colorist to take these images and turn them into these fantastic compositions. In this work, for example, we are presented with this slightly blurred but very clear figure of the female nude. Around this time, so this is painted in 1999, and this is around the time that she's working with uh, this Dutch filmmaker called Anton Corbin. And they went to Amsterdam um, and roamed the red light district and were using Polaroid images of strippers, and that's the stripper series. So you can see how she's engaging firsthand to make her own source material for certain works. So photography is source material and inspiration often touches Duma's work, but this work as well is quite significant in the tonality and in the process. Could you explain a little more about that? As you know, one of the most prominent painters painting today, she's known to be this master colorist. So she's working wet on wet. So she's applying different hues, different colors that she allows to wash and blur into one another, creating a very, very light impasto. And it's this that's so iconic in her work and very recognizable. And through that, you have these layers of red, blue, black that kind of merge together to present this persona, but also sort of blur the image between a real likeness that you see in the photography and a painterly depiction of angst and feelings. So Dumas often looks at raw emotions and pushes us to places that can be quite uncomfortable. How does she look to source materials or art historical references? 
one of the key points is her use of colour and the way she is this master colourist, but also the idea of angst. So she portrays this real sort of human emotion and commits to that. So if we look at the work of, for example, Edvard Munch, um, who, where angst, this sort of existential angst is such a key part of the work. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, looking at the work of Francis Bacon and her works were hung alongside his um, in the 90s, actually, before this was painted. And we see, you know, the way in which she's engaging with colour, with this fantastic sort of wet on wet kind of blurred wash technique and the way in which both Munch and Bacon in very different ways engage in co with colour to show this angst and this human condition. So definitely one to check out in the next sales. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your time. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be joined now by Cianne, and we're going to be discussing the iconic Canadian-American painter, Philip Guston, who for 50 years relentlessly painted turbulent and anxious times that he was experiencing. He explored so many different types of styles. So Sian, talk to us a little bit about this work. It's called The Canvas mm -hmm. and it's painted in 1970s, the mm -hmm. early part of the 70s. Mm -hmm. Why was this a significant time for Guston? Yeah, so I think these paintings that were painted in the last decade of his life are really interesting and important because that's when he's able to really reflect on his career and he becomes very introspective about his own painting throughout the years. And so in 1970s, he returned to figuration. In the 50s, he had gained a lot of success as an abstract expressionist, but he moved away from that and really shocked everyone in 1970 when he debuted these series of cartoonish figuration in a Marlboro exhibition in New York. And our present work is also very interesting because we see this motif of a single eye and this eye, of course, mm -hmm. is depicting the artist's own mm -hmm. eye and this wall, not just the physical wall potentially of some of, I suppose, some of the resistance that he was feeling, mm -hmm. but also potentially a metaphorical one because we see over the course of decades this shift and turn so much in his styles, don't we? Mm -hmm. And this new style that is almost, as you mentioned, cartoon-like, wasn't very well received at the time, was it? No, definitely not. And I think because he was so successful as an abstract expressionist and moving away suddenly to figuration was such a jarring move for such a successful artist at the time. But I think for Gustin, he felt that it was a necessary move because he felt that it was only through figuration that he can actually get change and express his belief in a way that wasn't so insular to himself. Well, he was constantly preoccupied with this idea of politics, of mm -hmm. anti-Semitism and other big racial issues of the time. Mm -hmm. So he was obviously born to an immigrant family mm -hmm. um, and he also was Jewish. Yeah. In what ways did his personal upbringing inform how he painted and some mm -hmm. of the experiences that he suffered? We see throughout his career these little motifs that show up from moments of his life and a lot of them are very traumatic and difficult moments. And in our present work we can see, yeah, as you mentioned, this brick wall which also reflects back on his first start as an artist when he was a muralist. And actually his first painting, painting the uh, Ku Klux Klansman, got, became a subject of big protests back in the day as well. And so he was always a very socially engaged artist and this move back to figuration really at the end of the day was about being socially engaged and being able mm -hmm. to express his views to the fullest. And it's almost through the eye he's forcing us to rethink our own perception mm -hmm. on some of these issues perhaps as mm -hmm. well. And quite rightly, he's earned lots of institutional recognition. Mm -hmm. And what do you think to be those highlights? And obviously there's something very exciting coming up here in the UK yes. too. Yes, it's very exciting that his big major retrospective that has traveled all around the US will be opening at Tate Modern and it's featuring over 150 works that span throughout his career. So I think that'll be really exciting to see everything from beginning to the end. So I'm now excited that we're going to be talking about Nicole Eisenman's Beer Garden with Big Hand. Why is this work so significant? It's obviously French-born American painter who's had a lot of profile around her discussions around society, around politics. And this is a body of work that she kicked off in the early 2000s. But why did it attract such attention? So she started her beer garden series in 2007 and it is definitely one of her most well-known and celebrated uh, series of works. 
people really enjoy looking at it because so much is always happening and there's always so much to look at. And a lot of the beer garden that she paints is based in Brooklyn, which is where she often frequents the beer gardens mm -hmm. around. And in our work especially, it's really crowded with so many things happening all at once. On one hand, you see people drinking in groups, having a great time. The other hand, you can see someone just dozing off by themselves. There's also a lost boy wandering around somewhere. And I think that kind of dynamism and also the ability to capture the true essence of the urban fabric. And she's often witty and subversive, but here we're seeing the artist, well, we believe it's the artist, to be holding, obviously, the beer glass. But at the same time, she was going through, obviously, a personal moment in time, wasn't she? Yeah, so when she first started the Beer Garden series is also when her partner first became pregnant. And she kind of speaks about her inability to actually socialize in real life and go to these beer gardens really prompted her to start painting them, I guess, as a way of escaping and kind of enjoying it um, vicariously through her artwork. Well, there's something so energetic and dynamic around the people and the way she's playing with this perspective of this kind of bulbous beer glass as well and looking through new perspectives. What do you think she would want our outtake to be from this work? I think she would love for us to just honestly spend the time, look closely, and really notice all the really fun and humorous bits that she's put into it, because she is such a funny artist at the end of the day. And there are some very strange things happening there. Someone with their pants down, at the same time carrying their baby, and I think just really enjoying and um, immersing ourselves into the fun, and chaotic world that she's painted. So it's a lesson in looking from Nicole Eisenman. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time, Tian. No worries, thank you so much. So we now come to one of the greatest painters of our time, and fortunately a painting that we are privileged to sit in front of. So I'm joined by James to discuss Gerhard Richter's Abstract Build 611. So, James, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. So, this work is extremely significant. It's one of Richter's works that was actually painted in 1986. Why was this year so significant? So, 1986 truly was a breakthrough for Gerhard Richter. It was at that very moment when he abandoned brushes in favour of the squeegee, which was to be his primary pictorial tool from there onwards. And actually the squeegee, unlike the brush, was both a tool of creation and simultaneous destruction. There's an amazing colour and chaos that comes through. So there's a real physicality, as you touch on with the squeegee, of the actual making. But can you talk us through the process of this type of work? So Gerhard Richter famously has worked in large, very white studios throughout his career. And Unlike a lot of abstract expressionist painters or painters who are really lost in the moment of creating that painting, Richter, by contrast, has had a very methodical process to creating his pictures. So he works in series, so he'll have created this painting alongside other paintings of a similar scale, often three or four or five paintings in the studio at the same time on the wall. So he'll do a mark on one painting, then move on to the next, and so on and so on. So when he comes back round to the painting again, he's looking at it with fresh eyes. And that process allows him to have an objective dis distance with the paintings he's making. And what fascinates me about Richter is that he looks at different mediums and starts to bring them together because he was an incredibly keen photographer, wasn't he? He was bringing that constantly into his work as well. Richter, as you say, has been a keen photographer throughout his life. And in fact, his, his early works in the 1960s, they were based on photographs or magazine source images. He wanted, again, to remove himself from the process of painting to allow a, a preconceived image to dictate what he was going to paint. But as a photographer himself, he was fascinated by the depth of colour you get in photographs, also the speed, the process, the infinite variations you can achieve by changing the focus, changing the light source, changing also the development of an image. And for Richter, that's what he was looking to replicate in a way through his abstract paintings. It was about the layering of the images. And when you look up close to the surface of this almost kaleidoscopic painting in terms of the ranges of colours and the movement and the surface, there's just so much going on there, but you can see that almost the ghosts of paintings underneath, each one he's gone successively over. 
I think everyone must make the time to come and see this painting over auction week. It's an absolutely astounding work and especially um, incredible to see it in person. We now come to the work of one of the foremost minimalist painters, Robert Ryman, and this work, Gate, was created in 1995. So first of all, can you describe the work that we're looking at? So Gate from 1995 is one of Ryman's great works from the 1990s. What appears to be a calm, very peaceful scene from a distance, up close, the viewer is met with this almost tempestuous surface of infinite depth and movement. There's so much going on in this painting when you're looking at it up close. And that comes from the materiality, but also this juxtaposition of, of white with the material. And Ryman was really known for this use of white, wasn't he? He was, yeah. I mean, Ryman followed a very strict artistic practice whereby he really wanted to explore the inherent mediums and qualities, the, the inner poetry of the materials he was using set within the confines of square format canvases or works of art using just white. But actually in this painting, as you can see, you've got exposed canvas around the edge. You've also got underneath the white, very thick impasto paint on top, you've got different colors coming through. And for him, it was about exploring the materials of the paint, but also the process of looking and creating art. And this process, he was really experimenting with himself by looking, wasn't he? Because he didn't start as an artist. How did he begin his own practice? So Robert Ryman first discovered art when he was working as a security guard at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where he started working in 1953. It was there that he became exposed to the work of Matisse and Rothko and Picasso and all the other great works of art he was surrounded by. And rather than having any formal artistic training, one day he decided to go to the art shop and buy some canvas, buy some paints, and just to see what would happen. And what I love about his work is that sense of unknown exploration that you get in each work. He, he's trying to see what is possible with painting. What are the material qualities of the paint? But also, what different effects can you achieve? By going for white paintings, he was able to really shift the focus onto light and movement and texture and composition in a way in which wouldn't have been possible had he been using multicolored compositions. So with Ryman, we really see a visual language that has continued to be enduring to this day. We now come to the alchemist of painting, Frank Bowling, and his work, Moby Dick. First, can we touch on the significance of the title and this piece in particular? Moby Dick from 1981 is one of Frank Bowling's most important paintings. It brings together two decades of experience of exploring the infinite possibilities of paint, both through figurative representations in the 1960s and then abstract poor paintings in the 1970s that he made whilst he was in the US. Now back home in England in early 1980s, we see Frank Bowling bringing together these experiences, these two contradictory modes of expression into paintings that I feel rank amongst his most important and finest achievements. And he's constantly playing, isn't he, with colour and different types of techniques. And he's talking here about water. So Frank Bowling's studio was right next to the River Thames, and he made a series of paintings about the, the Thames, the Thames pictures. Moby Dick doesn't fit within that series, but you can see here that he's working by the river. You can sense the, the movement, the fluidity of the paint. It's almost like the surface is alive. You've got so many different layers and kind of fluctuations of the paint, the way in which the layers overlap as well. It's very much a fluid process that you can see almost unraveling before your eyes. So he's constantly looking at nature and geopolitics. How do you think Frank's background informed his practice? Well, Frank had a very diverse upbringing, I, I suppose, compared to a lot of artists who he found himself working alongside at the Royal College of Art. He was born and raised in Guyana before coming to England aged 19. And it was there that he was working alongside Hockney and Kitai at the Royal College. After that, he moved to America. So he was kind of, again, soaking up more influences, more experiences. And all of these, I think, informed his work. And by the time he was back in England in the early 1980s, he'd really emerged as a full, confident artist in his own right who'd taken you know, the experiences of his childhood, London, New York, and now back again, working alongside the river. 
And this confidence is also really shown and recognised in the fact that he was the first black artist to receive a royal academician recognition. And he's had some great institutional shows of which this painting appeared in one. Yeah, so Moby Dick was very prominently displayed in the Tate show that Frank Bowling had here a couple of years ago. And also before that, it was shown at the Shahjah Biennial. This really is one of the artist's strongest works that I've ever seen. And it's certainly the strongest work to be offered at auction so far. James, thank you so much for talking us through the works today. So that concludes our gallery tour of the London sales here in Sotheby's. These works are available for preview and to the public from the 7th to the 12th of October. There'll also be some highlights from the Paris sales as well as from the Emily Fisher Landau collection. So whether you're a collector or just culturally curious, I'd highly recommend a visit.